。啊，各位同事，我哋夠快。Members,、uh, we've already formed a quorum, and it's time for us to start. First of all, I'd like to confirm the minutes of two meetings, one in January and another in February. The Secretariat has not received any proposal for amendment. Can we confirm the minutes? If so, the minutes are confirmed. I'd like to welcome the officials to the meeting. I won't introduce them one by one. Last time, we're actually on clause twenty-seven. Amending Section 40 in relation to educational institutions, as well as photocopies made by students. So we'll continue from that. I'll invite colleagues to ask questions. Mr. Dennis Crocker, Mr. Chairman, before members start, I'd like to mention some papers. CB bracket four, five seven eight, bracket zero one, which is a letter from the IFPI to this meeting, dated the eighteenth of February. And then in February, the American Chamber of Commerce also sent a letter to you, Mr. Chairman, and copied to me. It's again on the point of contract override. They oppose the inclusion of contract override. I mentioned this at the last meeting, Chairman. You might have、uh, recalled that. Well, here we know their opposing reasons. Well, Mr. Kwok, I would like to invite the government to respond first. I don't want to handle those papers today because all along we've been receiving submissions and letters from members of the community and organisations. I would like to go through these submissions at the end of this exercise. Yes, I share your view. I would like to have a reply from the bureau on their position on contract override, because the government intends to use that. It's because they are not clear, so they would like to resort to a commercial approach. That's my worry. If you allow commercial agreements. To be exempted, there will be huge problems for the whole bill. Such exemptions will have a huge impact on the overall exercise, Mr. Chen Chichun. Well, Mr. Chairman, may I know your approach of handling this? We got new documents continuously. For example, TVB sent in a submission covering. Contents that we've already covered, like hyperlinks. So, should we complete clause by clause scrutiny before coming back to these submissions? Then we may have to revisit the clauses. Well, let us complete clause by clause scrutiny first. In society, there is a wide variety of views. I'd like to target them at the end of the exercise. Otherwise, if we are to go on to these submissions and then come back to class by class scrutiny, and then tomorrow another organisation may submit something else, it will be rather confusing. Mr. To Mr. Chairman, I'd like the secretary to help us. Of course, I don't want us to go back every time we receive a submission. Say. If we are to start from pages twenty-nine and thirty of the markup version today, as we are discussing the provisions now, when we come to the relevant provisions, I'd like the secretary to remind us of the relevant submissions. We shouldn't just set aside the submissions and wait till the end of the exercise before we come back to them. 
Well, if members receive any submission, they should try to compare the submission or submissions with the relevant provisions. Maybe you should mark those provisions, and then when we discuss those provisions, you can comment on them. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm worried that, well, say if uh, we have a meeting in the morning and in the afternoon we receive new submissions. Mr. Sin Chong Kai, any more? No? All right. Colleagues, let's start. Last time we're on Clause 27. Clause 27. Now, C30112 of the Blue Bill and 3013 of the English version. Ms. Chen Yunhan, we've not discussed the government's reply yet. We're on clause by clause scrutiny. So, what will be your arrangement? Well, let's complete clause by clause scrutiny first. Oh, before we go on to the documents, right? Okay. Okay, Ms. Chong. Let's refer to Clause 28, uh, that is Section 46 of the Ordinance in relation to libraries. For libraries, we have expanded views. And for 46, you have in the title libraries, we've added in museums, originally only libraries and archives. We consider that nowadays many museums are playing the role of libraries, so some copyright exemptions should apply to them. So we've expanded the provision. And for individual exemptions, the scope of applicability is also widened. For example, well, let's proceed to Section 46, heading. Originally, libraries and archives were added in museum, and then for 46.1b, after library were added in museums. After adding in museums, the museum curator should also be included, together with librarians and archivists for photocopying. And then for 46 to B, we are to repeal library or archive and replace it by library, museum, or archive. References in any provision to a specified library, museum, or archive are to A library, museum, or archive of a description specified for the purposes of that provision under subsection 1b. That is to apply the provisions to library, museum, and archive. And then for 46.3b, again, we add in the curator. And then in 5, we would, for 46.3a, as well as 46.3b, uh, we would like to add in the curator and also for 46 bracket 5, such that the provisions will apply not only to libraries and archives, but also museums. Mr. Sin Chong Kai, by specified, what do you mean? Only the government and universities? May we know the coverage of specified? Well, for specified library or archive, that is 528B. You're correct just now. In general, all libraries managed by the LCSD of the government will enjoy the exemption. And now we're to add in museums. So for specified library, we should add in la museum as well. 
Well, the details will be specified in the subsidiary legislation. Of course, for non-profit making bodies and university libraries, they're for public use, so they'll also be covered. Of course, given the exemption for library, museum, or archive during the implementation of the bill, we'll have uh, to make detailed specifications. But this will be in the subsidiary legislation, right? Well, maybe I should say so. The Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development will specify by way of Gazetto. Do you have a full list? What what do what do you mean? What are you saying? Well, let me explain. This is to allow the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development to promulgate a piece of subsidiary legislation to specify the benefiting libraries, museums, and archives. So after the enactment of the ordinance, we'll do it by way of subsidiary legislation. And then we'll explain in detail to members what are the specified bodies. And Ms. Chong was saying that for public libraries, museums, or even non-profit making libraries and museums, we will like to cover them as well. But that's already covered by the word library, as Ms. Chong said. Well, what about libraries of secondary and primary schools? They are in schools. They should be covered. Yes, they are covered. That is, the existing subsidiary legislation does cover them, but we need a new piece of subsidiary legislation to cover all these. Ms. Claudia Mo, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to clarify the term archive. For traditional media, the press department and archives will be covered, right? What about online media? What about their archives? Will they be covered? That's my first question. We'll let them answer that first. Ms. Chong, for archives, they're already in the bill. 528B, as I mentioned, covers libraries and archives. There are broad provisions for non-profit making bodies or LCSD library archives. They should be covered. And for online archives, the existing legislation has not covered them. As Mr. Wong said, when we prepare the subsidiary legislation, we should further look into that in detail. For traditional media, like uh, a particular daily, I have a big archive, be it electronic or otherwise. Well, if it is a profit-making body, the legislative principle is to apply this to non-profit-making libraries and archives. What about newspapers? They are making profits. They're not charities. So they're not covered. Yes, they're not exempted. See, sub My next question is about 463A. Satisfied. What does that mean? Because... It says in the English version that uh, it required to be satisfied as to any matter. I don't understand the English or the Chinese version. I thank Ms. Claudia Mo for her question because in my recollection, very often when it comes to legislation, uh, the English text often contains the word required to be satisfied, so on and so forth. In fact, after 1997, um, the translation for to be satisfied actually means uh, that um, to the satisfaction of so uh, certain matters, so and so. Uh, I recall that uh, this matter has been discussed in the past um, many times, but I didn't take part in previous discussions. So just to lay the background for you, Ms. Sitho. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question on museums. Well, just now um, the government said that by way of uh, Shachu, the 
list of um, museums and non-profit making libraries would be set out, but there are private museums which uh, may not be profit making. Of course, if it doesn't have the uh, uh, CAP 88 um, ILD status, it won't be regarded as a charitable organization. Yes, this is the uh, this is the uh, direction. Uh, it's a non-profit making uh, organization. That is uh, the general idea, and we will consider the details. Uh, in due course, but the major prin principle is that it should benefit the public. Well, for education institutions, they uh, exempted under previous provision in relation to education institutions. What about the hospital museum or the medical museum? Uh, it is a privately run museum. So, is it covered? Will it be done by way of a subsidiary legislation? Or will a holistic view be taken? We'll take a holistic approach in considering libraries, museums, and archives and see if we could widen the scope. And this is a policy consideration. So in terms of scope, will you also consider something uh, about that? Scope or size is really difficult to draw the line. Uh, we haven't come to that, but if it's relevant, we will also consider it. Please continue. So next, class 30 in the blue bill, section 48 amended. Copying by librarians, part of published works. So first of all, in f section 48.1, Well, um, a paragraph will be deleted um, to be substituted with the following. That is, the librarian of a specified library may, in the, if the prescribed conditions are complied with, make and apply, and then uh, certain deletions to be substituted with a copy of art, part of a published literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work, other than an article in a periodical, or part of the published uh, recording or film. And then the last bit will also be um, deleted. That is, the or in the typographical arrangement will be repealed and substituted by in the typographical arrangement or in the sound recording of him, as the case may be. So may, basically, we've added the sound recording or film to widen the scope. Any questions, Ms. Sitho? Chairman, well, I haven't read through all the amendments, but in 46, um, about libraries, archives, museums, there are three types, and then certain powers and certain exemptions are given. As for 48, it's only about uh, librarians. So will different exemptions be given to different types of institutions? Yes, Ms. Sitho is correct, because in relation to Section 48, that is the case. In the following sections, there are different. Uh, they apply to different circumstances. Section forty-eight applies to librarians. However, it doesn't apply to libraries, museums, and archives. Well, basically, here we're talking about copying by librarians of published works, um, which are usually published literary, dramatic, musical, art, or artistic work, or sound recording or film. Originally, such exemption is given only to librarians. As for the circumstances applicable to libraries and archives in general, this section doesn't apply. In other sections, uh, they will deal with um, what you mentioned, that is copying in museums, archives, etc. Well, Chairman, in 48-2A, this also happens to archives. Well, Ms. Sitho, let's not rush. We'll go to, uh, we'll soon uh, come to section 50 and 51. And, uh, but I believe they're covered. Uh, we don't always want to go back because for section 48, 
um, here. It says it says for purposes of research and private study, and this also happens in archives. Mr. Um, Mr. Kai, no, you didn't raise your hand, Miss Claudia Mo. I'd like to ask about two B. No person is furnished with more than one copy of the same material, etc. I'd like to know the legal principle behind. Let's say if I've been given a copy, then that's it. But I can also ask um, Ms. Sitho and Mr. Ray Chen to have a copy of, for themselves. Well, Ms. Sitho just now asked why this only applies to librarians. Because under normal circumstances, a person may wish to borrow um, some materials for research or private study. But there are also reference materials in the library which cannot be photocopied um, by users themselves. They may need to rely on the help of librarians. So that's why we've included um, B, that is, no person should be furnished with more than one copy of the same material in order to avoid abuse. So the librarian himself must make such requests. So if um, Ms. Claudia Mo would like to make five copies on behalf of um, others, say Mr. Ray Chen and Ms. Sitho as well, we're talking about uh, giving reasonable exemption and uh, using the copyrighted materials reasonably. I'm still on B. No person is furnished with a copy of more than a reasonable proportion of any work. What is meant by reasonable proportion? Reasonable to whom? Now, uh, it depends on the work. In fact, in the subsidiary legislation, there will be copyright, copyright libraries regulation. And as I said just now, we do have an existing version. And after the scope is widened, consequential amendments will have to be made to the regulation to set out, for example, what is meant by reasonable proportion. And in the subsidiary legislation I mentioned, in Regulation 6, it provides that in relation to a reasonable proportion, um, say, for, an in, uh, for a, a standalone article, it should not exceed 4,000 words. For a series of summaries, then each summary should not exceed 3,000 words or altogether. 8, 000, it should not exceed 8,000 words. And in some circumstances, not more than 10% of the copyrighted materials. So indeed, these are set out in the subsidiary legislation. Any other questions from members? All right, if there are no other questions from members, I'll continue. Section 50. Section 50 is copying by librarians, supply of copies to other libraries. So this is about the supply of copyrighted materials from one library to another. And in 51B, we propose to delete published edition of a literary, dramatic, or musical work and substitute it with published literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work. So basically, we've added the word artistic work, work to widen the scope. Since the existing provision only, provi only um, include literary, dramatic, or musical work. And we now think that artistic work should also be included, which means photos, paintings, sculptures. Mr. Sin Chung Kai, I understand that some exemptions are given to librarians through this section. However, I stand to be corrected, but in the copyright ordinance, there is no definition on uh, software. And if I remember correctly, literary work is regarded as software. 
So can somebody co make a copy of um, the software of a literary work? Ms. Chong? E, right, um, Mr. Sen Chong Ka, you, are, uh, you actually know quite well about the definition of software, and that um, software is regarded as literary work. However, this section only applies to the provision of copyrighted articles from uh, between libraries, um, not about provision to the public. And it also literary work also covers software, as you mentioned. But normally, when the software is supplied, um, there are other restrictions. For example, um, license. So this is a special um, exception uh, that you mention. But normally, when we talk about literary work under this section, we're talking about books. I have a follow-up question. Now, exemption will be given under this section. Let's say if a librarian procures some software and uh, as you mentioned, they're subject to uh, software licenses, then will the ordinance override the software license? Let's say if the software license only um, it requires that the software be installed only on one computer, then will the, this exemption override this uh, license? If it doesn't, um, it, I find it easier to accept. Otherwise, well, well please explain to me. Ms. Chong. Well, before Ms. Chong answers, well, let me supplement. For Section 50, Mr. Sin raised a question. Actually, for the um, existing ordinance, we already have the term literary work. The copyright ordinance since its enactment in 1997 has been operating in such a manner, and so far I haven't seen any major problem. You raise a technical point. So that depends on the license agreement, whether this will be affected. Ms. Chong, would you like to supplement? Yes. For the the current uh, copyright ordinance, Section 50, provides or uh, relates to copying by librarians supply, supply of copies to other libraries. It, now, if uh, the material is something that can be um, accessed very easily, or that authorization could be given, then no, uh, then copy. Uh, it may not be necessary for libraries to exchange copies. So that actually addresses Mr. Sin's question. If there is some form of um, licensing mechanism or authorization mechanism, then this section doesn't apply. Well, let me give you an example. Um, a university may have five, five or six libraries, and uh, the one of the libraries may procure software to be installed in other libraries. If there is a licensing uh, or authorization mechanism, then uh, right, it, it can't. But if there is only one software, then if there is no authorization uh, mechanism, then yes, it can be installed. Ms. <laughs> Claudia Mo. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to seek clarification on one point. If uh, there's any misunderstanding, please tell me. For photocopying in libraries, or copying in libraries, if I scan the pages one by one, say for the whole book, I scan the pages one by one. I don't know whether this is called hyperlink. Well, scanning has nothing to do with hyper hyperlinks. Scanning is a form of copying. So it's covered here. Yes. Well, if there's an exemption for copying, the copying may be in any form. But of course, uh, that is subject to exemption provisions as well. 
Well, let me ask a more detailed question. Say if I'm a student, if I have to apply to the librarian each and every time for scanning and copying, when I face a document, if I use my iPhone to take pictures of the pages one by one, is it against the law? Well, Chairman, let me clarify this. This is about library operations. For individual library users, when they make copies, well, this is happening now. There are photocopiers with copyright notices to remind you. Take, for example, for personal studies as a fair arrangement, if anybody comes to a particular page in a particular book, a copy can be made under exemption. Same for cameras. Well, we've discussed this before. Well, you said artistic work covers, photos, paintings, sculptures, and so forth. Take, for example, paintings. If I make photos of them, this has nothing to do with the library, right? Yes, but what about sculptures? I cannot copy a sculpture. I can only take a photo of it. Well, a three-dimensional sculpture, if you use a two-dimensional camera to make a photo of it, then it is also copying. Oh, this has widened my eyes. Well, actually, photography is a different media. It's two-dimensional. So in law, a two-dimensional copying of a three-dimensional object is also copying, right? Well, 3D copy to 3D is, of course, copying. I'd like to ask about artistic work. Just now, the government mentioned photos, paintings, and sculptures. Well, this is Mr. Chen Chi Chin. What about the use for display, for borrowing? They're covered. For sculptures, just now we're told that two D copying is also copyright related. But what about three D copying and then taking photos? Well, we're talking about. Library, library exchanges. As for this particular clause, if you don't know the copyright holder, then you benefit from this provision. Therefore, for photos and paintings, they're covered. If you want to make a copy and then to another library, you'll benefit from this provision. That is copying among libraries, but can they lend the copy to somebody else? Well, if I if uh, library A copies to library B, then of course it is covered by this provision. But what if library B further lends it to library C? Well, still it should be regulated by this provision. Well, this provision is particularly about copying among libraries themselves. But for, say, members of the public, we have another provision. Clause f well, Section 51, copying by libraries or archivists, uh, replacement copies of works. Well, 51.1 would like to repeal the librarian or archivist of a specified library or archive and replace it by library curator or archivist of a specified library, museum or archive. That's for storage and other uses. This is to add in. Museum curators and for preservation purpose. And then subject 
to A, the specified librarian, curator, or archivist can also conduct such acts. To order to preserve or replace that item by placing the copy in its permanent collection in addition to or in place of it, or in order to replace in the permanent collection of another specified library, museum, or archive an item which has been lost, destroyed, or damaged. without infringing the copyright in any literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work, in any illustrations accompany such a work, or in the case of a published edition in the typographical arrangement, or in the sound recording or film. So this is to add in artistic work as well as museum. And for 1A, copying in order to preserve or replace certain items and no more than three copies. Originally, it's one copy. One copy can be for the public. The remaining copies can stay in the establishment itself for collection purpose. There are valuable items, dilapidated items, or old items that have preservation value. So no more than three copies can be made of these. No, if. There is no question. Let's move on. Yes, the next section is 51, capital A. Ms. Mo, well, musical and voice recording, should you differentiate them? Music is a creative work. Voice recording is voice recording. So what sort of voice recording? For musical works. If you're a composer, you may have written works, the musical scores, for example. But for voice recordings, like uh, audio tapes, records, and online sound recordings. But we have uh, books in sound recordings, will they come under the category of literary work? Well, take for example, in future, when I have a dialogue with you, I interview you, and there's a voice recording, is it literary work or sound recording? Well, both. Uh, the work itself is a literary work, and the voice recording is also covered by copyright protection. So you need, there are two copyrights here. Ms. Chen Yunhan, well, which, on which provision are you? Well, I was at another meeting. Which provision? Clause 42 or section 42? No, we're on 51A. Oh, you have passed 42. Can I go back to that? I can't go back to that. Well, please do so later. Because if colleagues keep going in and out of the conference room and then on return, they go back to previous provisions, then, Mr. Chairman, let me tell you this. Sooner or later, I'll withdraw from this post committee. Well, you're indispensable. Well, I complained. Well, there's no way out. If you have any specific comments, you can write them down and hand them to me. And when you're away, I can read them out and ask questions on behalf of you. 51 capital A. Sorry, the speaker was not coming through. Now, section 51A 
is a new clause. Communication by librarians, curators, or archivists, copies of works. We introduce the right to broadcast to the public. So we have to expand the original provisions here. Just now we said that librarians, curators, or archivists of specified library, museum, or archive may without infringing copyright, communicate a copy of an item in the permanent collection of the library, museum, or archive to the users or staff of the library, museum, or archive by making it available online to be accessed through the use of a computer installed within the premises of the library, museum, or archive. So through the use of a computer terminal. So it must be in a specified library, museum, or archive, and through the use of a computer terminal in those premises. For bracket two, the conditions are that only one user may access the copy at any one time, and B, that the library, museum, or archive takes appropriate measures to prevent users from making further copies or communicating the copy to others. Bracket three, communicating to users and staff of a specified library, museum, or archive is not authorized by this section if or to the extent that Licenses under licensing schemes are available, authorizing the communication in question, and the person making the communication in question knew or ought to have been aware of that. Ms. Claudia Mo, Mr. Chairman, this is precisely what I'd like to ask about 48. Now, you can, in the library, you can provide the copy to one person, or rather, one copy but maybe to more than one person, say for personal study. But in a library, uh, sorry, in a museum, you can't do that. In overseas museums, they don't just allow you to go in and look at the actual object. They have computer terminals. In the British Museum, in the central big round structure, Many visitors can look at the same object at the same time. But of course, for those with a history of more than 50 years, so there's no more copyright. But for contemporary objects like radio watches or the very famous chair, they have a history of less than 50 years. A contemporary museum may have collected them. But if uh, the computer terminal can only allow one user at any one time, then we'll be very far away from overseas museums. It's too restrictive. And what about the size of the copy? Must it be of the same size as the, the original object? What if uh, it is of a different size? Museums publish a lot of manuals or compendia of uh, paintings or other publications. Well, such a big painting may be reduced to the size of uh, a painting book, a book on paintings. Will that be considered as a copy and fall within this provision? If so, it will be very unfortunate it is a restriction for the museums. And then something about archives. I'd like the government to tell me more. For uh, the office, uh, archives office in the UK, um, they welcome the public's uh, uh, visits. So every summer we go there, we make um, a lot of photocopies in relation to, say, the uh, joint declaration uh, negotiation and other. Uh, materials. So I'd like to know whether we're being too stringent when it comes to the use of copyrighted materials. Well, um, two parts 
um, of your question. First, whether the material can be accessed by uh, more than one user at a time in a museum. I'd like to say that 51A refers to items that uh, cannot easily be found in the market, and we therefore uh, allow copying for, say, collection or communication. For 51A, we widen the scope by providing that the copy uh, may be accessed through the use of a computer terminal installed within the museum so as to reduce the chance of the um, item becoming further um, dilip uh, more dil dilapidated. And uh, as for Ms. Sidho's example, as I understand, this comes in some form of electronic authorization. I think um, if we have this mechanism in the museums in Hong Kong, this is also applicable. What about the size? Well, there is no specification as to size. Um, photocopying or copying of the item would constitute um, co a copy. Uh, even in the case of um, a 2D into 3D or vice versa. Well, let me supplement, Chairman. Um, for example, users of the archives c can make photocopies. And in fact, um, the situation regarding libraries is similar. Uh, a person may make a photocopy of an item in the library for research or private study. And according to the previous provisions discussed, the photocopy uh, can be made. So this is not just about the library collection. Secondly, sometimes an item in the collection may be um, photocopied or copied uh, in the pamphlet as a form of a guide. And we have uh, a previous provision um, which talks about quotation. And by having this quotation mechanism, we can allow the use of this um, copied item on the guide for users. And another scenario will be a shop outside the museum uh, may be selling a replica of the co uh, collectible item or a um, book or a catalogue for sale and consent from the copyright owner will have to be sought. So that's according to different uh, arrangements. Mr. Wong, can you tell me where can I find this ex exemption? For example, there's an exhibition and you need to have posters, pamphlets about the exhibition telling people that um, there'll be um, so-and-so paintings, and um, there will be copies of the painting in the pamphlet. Well, in 39, we talk about quotations, and this is one of the applicable exemptions. All right, Chairman. About the use within the premises, and that um, a license is required for use. I think this is the problem. We talk about um, developing Hong Kong into a knowledge-based society, and if the user is not really copying an item to bring it home to make a profit, if the user only wants to access the item through the computer terminal in the library or museum, why do we still need this restriction? Where do we find the condition? It's in 51A to A, that only one user may access the copy at any one time. Well, Chairman, let me explain the spirit of 51A is that for 
an item in the permanent collection. Um, according to the previous provision, copies may be made for the purpose of preserving the item, and then um, we may need to impose restrictions on uh, viewing the item. And there are also special permissions for libraries' use uh, for such items, and we believe that um, we can have the same license arrangement here. This is also one of the principles. Well, Chairman Levy, let me give you one example. Say we have the Hong Kong Films Archive uh, archives. I don't know whether there are computer terminals there for users to say uh, research on the uh, on film history in Hong Kong, and some materials might have uh, passed the fifty year period, and some may be more recent. Uh, some um, docudrama, for example. So, will license be required? And uh, how is the actual operation done if a user is to view this item? Chairman, I think we can look at the next provision. It's 52A. This is about sound recordings or films. Well, Chairman, instead of going through section by section, I'd like the government to explain to me, say for Hong Kong Film Archives, if a user would like to study the film history of Hong Kong, um, old films beyond 50 years may not be subject to the copyright ordinance. What about recent films? Let's say if two students go there at the same time, and if they are happy to pay a fee, um, how should the operation be done? Now, let's deal with 51A first. I think when it comes to 52A, we can address your example, Mr. Ray Chen. All right, you first, Ms. Claudia Mo. Thank you. 51A1. Computer terminal or uh, online, uh, yes, that's the term. However, through the use of a computer terminal installed, but technology is advancing. Maybe very soon, um, instead of using a computer terminal, we have uh, we can have uh, a similar device inst instead. So why do you have to put such a concrete term, computer terminal, here? Well, in fact, in the UK Act, the same bit uh, is included in the exemption clause. So this is international terminology which we think can apply to uh, our law. And uh, I think the um, so far the most pre prevalent devices that we see are computer terminals. Uh, if we are to choose. Um, different terms, we need to consider whether the terms are the most appropriate. But the drawing reference from overseas legislation, we believe the term computer terminal uh, will be the most prevalent, um, most commonly used term. Um, I have another question, 51 to A. I still don't quite understand your answer. Uh, that only one user may access the copy at any one time. That's how it's written. Well, let's say if um, a book is part of a library collection, um, if it's lent to a user, then it can't be used by another user. So that's in line with um, a physical item, equivalent to a library book, for example. If it's lent to a user, then it cannot be made available to another user. So. If this item is copied, then uh, the same principle should apply. Although the use uh, of the electronic, uh, the use of electronic means is just to facilitate users. I still don't quite understand the rationale. To be 
that the library, museum, and archive takes appropriate measures to prevent users from making further copies. What does that mean? You can say make other copies instead of further copies. I think this is a drafting point. In English, it's further. That means um, some more copies. So apart from making the electronic copy in the library, no other copies should be made. So instead of using the word further, uh, you should use uh, some other terms. Well, it seems like um, you have previous copies, but anything is better than an impasse. This is just a drafting point, Mr. Ray Chen. Well, my question is this. 51A has to do with communication. So is it because of this that um, 51A1 is about making it available online through the use of a computer terminal within the premises? Well, instead of, say, uh, copying it onto um, DVD-ROM or CD-ROM or USB, because uh, in those situations you're talking about copying. For in this situation, there is no such physical copy. Now, for this online, uh, what this this word online, as I understand, this is um, on the internet instead of on the internet, right? And I have a question on only one user. As I understand. As far as the intranet is concerned, it means the connection between one computer and another. Yes, only um, the restriction lies in um, having only one user at the terminal. Mr. Christopher Jung, also on this. Well, of course, if you have a physical item and you make a hundred thousand copies, and only one user can view the physical item at a time, but if it's copied electronically, then ten users can view the same file at the same time, then it will be a breach uh, of this provision. Why are you imposing this restriction? Is it because when you um, buy the copyright, you pay a fee uh, for its license? This is an administrative issue. Thank you, Mr. Chong, for your question. As explained by Ms. Chong, 51A, uh, of course, if there is a licensing arrangement, then um, definitely uh, you can allow more users than one. But I think the principle is, according to Ms. Chong, uh, if we are viewing the electronic version of an item, uh, we should adhere to the principle. Well, uh, there should only be one copy in the library collection, and only one user may access that item at one time. Now, according to the same principle, but why do we need to follow the same principle? Say, if something is very popular and many would like to view the same item at the same time, uh, why should I need to wait for half an hour before Ms. Sid Ho um, finishes uh, reviewing the item? There is no such need. Um, Making electronic is uh, to facilitate uh, other users. This is the principle. But wh why do we need this principle? This is to facilitate the transfer of knowledge. If we want more visits to the library, if we want more people to appreciate these artistic items, why can't, can't we make it unlimited? You're restricting knowledge dissemination. Well, can you arrange for, say, 10 persons to view Chi Bai Shi's painting at the same time? Well, that's where the meaning lies. Whether or not it's 10 persons watching at the same time or N persons watching at the same time, will it make a di difference in terms of breaching of the law? Well. Well, if you're talking about actual objects, if you want 10 persons to read, say, a particular book at the same time, the library will have to buy 10 copies of that book. Some 
collections in a particular museum or library may already be broken or very fragile. So there are for collection and storage only. So copies may be made for the use of the watchers. Well, sometimes users may not need to look at the actual object. They may use a computer terminal to look at a copy. Because originally only one person may be allowed to use it. So given the authorization, as the chairman said, authorization can be taken out or purchased or allow many persons to watch the object at the same time. Well, for the benefit of the copyright holders, you are setting restrictions to knowledge and culture dissemination. You're limiting Hong Kong's development as a knowledge-based society. Well, say for a book, say if there's only one copy in the library, users are subject to that restriction as well. Only one person can read the book at the same time. But very often, libraries keep more than one copy of a book. But I know that well, Mr. Christopher Chung had been an urban counselor. But for actual books, a library usually keeps at least three copies of the same book. So here, at least you should allow three persons to have a look at the same time. Then talk about science and technology. Say if there's a class of 10 students, if they, within a restricted period of time, must look at the particular object, then maybe only 10 persons will have to queue up to look at that one single object. So why can't you allow 10 students to watch the object at the same time online? You see, in universities, we sometimes have the bad students who try to borrow and get hold of a book for a prolonged period of time. In fact, restrictions can be set at the computer terminals. So why should you adopt such restrictive approaches to restrict knowledge dissemination? You can still protect the copyright holder. Well, it depends on the objective of the copyright ordinance. On the one hand, we'd like to encourage creativity, to encourage creative works. So economic benefits have to be protected. At the same time, we'd like to disseminate knowledge. We have to strike a balance between the two because we must not allow people to benefit from the fruit of the copyright holder without doing something. Because a library without the authorization of the copyright holder may already make a copy of the work. If we do not limit the number of users, it will not be reasonable. Of course, we can make arrangements for more than one person to look at the work at the same time. Now, we have to respect the intellectual property and copyright of the copyright holder. Mr. Chairman, if something is considered worthy of collection by a library or museum, then there are historical and cultural values attached to that product. Because if a particular work has no historical or cultural value, the museum should not keep it. But of course, if there's only one sole copy, the copyright holder should uh, produce more editions for sale. So the work won't be one sole object in the museum collection. So you shouldn't restrict dissemination. I don't think we're restricting dissemination. The copyright holder, because of the protection of the ordinance and because there is a market, can produce more copies and 
Libraries can also purchase those copies, so we're not restricting dissemination. This is what Ms. Ho said. Through market forces, we can disseminate knowledge, and at the same time, the copyright holder can have economic returns. Under the copyright ordinance. Uh, there are bound to be conflicts of interest. On the one hand, we need to disseminate culture and culture. So, on some occasions, the permission of the copyright holder may not be required. On the other hand, we must make sure that the copyright holder has sufficient economic returns. So, we have to try as far as possible to strike a balance. I cannot say. That purely because of the value for historical and cultural collection will not protect the copyright holder. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have to tell Mr. Wong that he's wrong on one point. In Hong Kong, if you publish a book, you have to provide three copies to the university libraries and other libraries free of charge because. Here, you only allow one person to look at that work at the same time. So this is a worse scenario. Well, they are talking about books. For any library, there are at least three free copies of each book for borrowing or lending. Well, it depends on the actual oct. Object. If I have three books, I can of course lend them to three persons. But if the library is only one copy, then only one person can look at it at the same time. It depends on the actual object itself. Well, that is not a good analogy. The publisher is duty bound to provide three free copies. Just give you a physical object won't suffice. We're talking about soft copies. We're talking about books. We're talking about so copies. So if it is the only remaining or surviving object or item, then it would be different, Mr. Chen Chichun. Mr. Chairman, actually, I don't quite understand what you are arguing about. If I delete to A, then to the copyright holder, what will be the actual loss or inconvenience? We're talking about transmission from one computer to another through an intranet. So we're only arguing whether many people should look at it at the same time, or queuing up to look at the object one at a time. Thank you, Ms. Ho. Thank you, Mr. Chan's reminder. Let us look at the spirit of the ordinance. We're talking about a library with valuable works. Just one sole copy. So normally, only one user can use it at the same time. Say, if we take books as an as an example, one. Only one reader can read that book at any one time, and there are reasons for the library to keep copies. So we allow copying under that circumstance because of culture's sake. We don't want to lose the only remaining actual object. So I cannot give you the genuine object. I can only give you a copy. So it's under the same principle and spirit、uh, that we draft this exemption. You said that many people want to watch or use the book. Well, I know nothing about the arrangement of providing three free copies to each library. I have no knowledge about that. In the market, if books are produced, if there are economic benefits, the producers may produce copies. Well, Mr. Chairman, I understand the logic behind this, but I'm asking: if we delete this provision, what loss would be incurred on the copyright holder, or what inconvenience would be incurred on him? 
if there is a need, if there are economic benefits, the library can produce more versions, or rather, the publisher can produce more editions or versions for libraries to procure. Without this provision, how can they make copies? You're asking a technical issue or an issue in principle. In law, if I allow more than one person to watch the book without the permission of the copyright holder, then there's one more possibility. So users benefit is the copyright holder's loss because originally the copyright holder can produce more copies and through a license scheme or whatever, users can purchase those additional copies. So one party's gain is another party's loss. Mr. Christopher Chung? Well, this is no loss to the author or copyright holder. The question is just that whether you only allow one person to read it at any one time or allow ten persons to look at it at the same time. No loss to the copyright holder. It's just that more time is spent by more persons. You cannot use electronic editions as an analogy because the method of use is completely the uh, completely different from the method of use of traditional copies. Well, you're saying that at most only two persons can look at the book, but not ten persons. But for online versions, ten persons can be reading the book at the same time, but there's no late gain or loss on the part of the copyright holder. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me make myself clearer. There is an economic loss here. Through a licensing scheme, the copyright holder can allow the library concerned to allow as work uh, to be used by more than one person. That's under the license scheme. So economic benefits are involved. If we don't set restrictions to the use of the sole copy, then the library does not have to obtain permission from the copyright holder or license holder. From the angle of the users, of course they want to look at the work concurrently. But to the copyright holder, there will be a loss on the gains that he originally should have reaped in giving out more licenses or allowing more licenses. So for 51 capital A bracket 3 is for that purpose. 51 capital A bracket 1 bracket 2 and bracket 3 are under three different principles. Well, 1 and 2 are under the same principle, and 3 is under another principle. For bracket 1, it's stipulated therein that a library or museum can produce copies, but with conditions, and the conditions are set out in bracket 2. When the conditions are satisfied, it's not an infringement. In bracket 3, it is stipulated that a license is required, so no infringement. So these are two different matters. It's not that we are deliberately imposing an obstruction to the dissemination of knowledge. We need to strike a balance um, between knowledge dissemination and respect for copyright owners. Mr. Charles Mock, Chairman, just now Mr. Wong said that the copyright owner may, by way of license, 
allow access to the copy by more than one user in the library. Do you have information whether this has happened in the past? Because, frankly, if you don't make available more copies for viewing, you won't know whether actually um, how many people would be interested in viewing them. Whether the item has any real market value. So I want to know whether um, the uh, possibility uh, is uh, or really exists. Well, I am also a library user. I use computer terminal in libraries, and there are different electronic information available in computer terminals in libraries. And users are allowed to view a vast amount of information and databases in computer terminal in the library. And if I remember correctly, by way of license, these information and databases are used by users, more than one user. Now, of course, if the user is a business entity, then there will be another arrangement. Now, I may be more familiar with um, the following. Uh, Wise News, for example, that's a news archive. It's actually um, a dissemination of copied uh, news articles, and it's big business, and uh, there is government investment in it, and it has sought copyright owner's consent to disseminate news articles on a daily basis. And I understand there is um, economic value or financial value in this uh, regard. Um, and it's done by way of license. All right, I understand the market value for that, but I'd like to know about the sole copies that we've been discussing. Uh, is it because copyright owners are reluctant about making any precedents and they are very being very strict about it? We understand for wise news that's one example. But in the case of um, sole copies, it's the problem really severe. If it's used by, say, more than one user, but not too many users, say, between 1 and 10, not as many as 1,000, then do we have any room to consider this middle-of-the-road approach? Thank you, Mr. Mark, for your question. I don't have information at hand about the situation you mentioned. We need to make um, subsidiary legislation on uh, an item in the permanent collection of the library. And in fact, uh, ever since the consultation stage, we have been heading um, in the same direction. That is, we want to protect copyright owners whilst at the same time make it more convenient for users to access them. We understand that, yes, there can be copies in the library, but how should they be used? Now, if we don't have the genuine item, we only have a replica, then again, there should only be one replica for one user at a time. Of course, I'm not happy with the government's answer. I hope the government go back and think about this. Must you be so stringent such that only one user may access the copy at any one time? I don't want to talk about the library because there may be books that are recent that are still in the market for sale. Uh, some audiovisual items, for example, that may have a commercial value. I understand that. But if you're talking about um, a lost item or a single item that uh, that 
is no longer available in the market, that some some work that is no longer published in the market, or there isn't enough incentive for it to be reprinted or republished, and yet uh, we're talking about uh, an item that uh, quite a lot of users may be interested in viewing. I'm really talking about communication by museums and archives. And if you also impose the same condition on museums and archives, that only one user may access the copy at any one time. On uh, First of all, I don't see how the um, commercial interest of copyright owners would be affected. But please go back and consider this. I understand that uh, you, uh, um, as a government official, may stand quite firm, but please do go back and think about it. If you allow more than one user to access the copy of a sole item at a time, it doesn't really affect its market value or the business interest. Um, uh, for the other point I raised, the government official mentioned Section 39 on fair use, and in fact, 39 states that it's about quotation, fair reporting, quotation, etc. So, let's say if I want to publish a pamphlet for um, exhibition goers, it's not reporting, right? Is quotation, but on reading the provision briefly, which subsection under the new section thirty nine safeguards the use of such copyright? Uh, work in the pamphlet. Chairman, I'd like to ask the legal advisor whether this safeguard is sufficient because I see at a glance under 39.2 for quotation it says whether for the purpose of criticism, review, or otherwise. So, uh, I mean, the purpose of um, otherwise, is it a sufficient safeguard? Publishing a pamphlet is not really a criticism or review. Now, from our policy intent and our way of drafting, we believe that this is um, applicable because for quotation, in the next provision, in fact, in section 39.2c, it says the extent of the quotation is no more than is required by the specific purpose for which it is used. So, other purposes may be allowed. This is uh, what we confirm that it is applicable according to international um, practices. Now, uh, Chairman. 39.2c, it says the extent of the quotation. I'm talking about the same, uh, say, a painting when it is re uh, copied. Of course, I'm not talking about copying um, in the same size. Of course, it will be reduced in a pamphlet in size. It cannot be um, put on display or for exhibition. And I just want to know whether, according to the English version, the extent of the quotation is okay. I mean, the Chinese version is okay, but I don't think it's a hundred percent equivalent. I understand, uh, and I agree that the Chinese version is all right, but for the English version, the extent of the quotation, I think this is problematic. May I seek help from the legal advisor? We'll go back and think about it. Yeah, so go back and think about it. So the government, uh, please go back and think about it because in the English version, it seems that um, 
this doesn't really address the exemption. And I think、uh, this committee agrees that if a museum publishes a pamphlet to introduce the exhibition, and if the painting is、uh, copied in a small、uh, thumbprint in the exhibition, then exemption should be given. I don't think this is a sufficient safeguard, however. Mr. Porcher, fifty-eight. Fifty capital A. Just now,、um, Chairman, you mentioned that、uh, subsection one and two is、uh, the same thing. Section subsection three is something else. So, does it mean? That、um, they cannot、uh, take place at the same time. Well, yes, indeed. Let me supplement. Now, this is about a license for communication. Having considered electronic libraries, and we have e license and e libraries, and For the copying and communication of、uh, items through electronic means, the right lies with the copyright owner. So, we need to、um, say protect copyright owners as well by way of license. The copyright owner may allow many users to access the electronic copy at any one time. Um, communication. Um, I mean, if licenses under licensing schemes are available, authorizing the communication in question, then this exemption、um, needs not be invoked. This is only about the situation without the licensing scheme, and that we want to facilitate users. I think、um, the purpose is to facilitate the general public using libraries, and if. Well,、uh, if when there are licensing schemes available, this exemption doesn't apply, then、um, is it really against、uh, public's interest or、uh, well or the welfare policy for the public? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think it can be put this way because、um, the library seeks to disseminate、uh, knowledge. In the past,、um, the libraries procure. Library books, and we need resources for that, for use by different library users. Similarly, if the economic return of a copyright work is not really by the sale of the of book itself, but by giving license to users, then. Uh, in the same vein, the library should、um, use its own resources to to、um, get licenses from copyright owners. Well,、uh, for newly published books, three books should be made available in in libraries. Then this is not utilizing library resources. The books come from the publisher themselves. And、um, this is for public viewing. Similarly, free e-copies should be made available in libraries for public viewing at a time, say for a minute. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, for a question. First、uh, of all, I need to get an understanding about the three copies being made available. At libraries, and we also need to go back and think about Ms. Ho's point and see、uh, whether this could be addressed、uh, in line with our policy. There is such a requirement. In fact, the electronic copy should not be、um, faring worse than、uh, the physical 
copies because even for physical copies, the library can have three copies. I'd like to talk about this provision about communication. That means in the library, the copy can only be transferred from one computer terminal to another computer terminal in the library, or does it mean? Uh, or is it the case that if I have ten floors in the library, if I have a lot of computer terminals, I can um, communicate to many um, users? Or, but this won't be safe. Or should we go back to the previous version, and that one should be kept in the collection, the other should be made available for borrowing? When you're talking about uh, copying or and communicating, if you're talking about copying, you should refer to the previous section. If you're talking about communication, only one user may access a copy at one computer terminal in the library. Of course, as far as IT is concerned, uh, you may, um, you know, put some restrictions so that one user may have access to the copy. Let's say if I have ten floors, and if I put this on the intranet, allowing uh, that all ten floors to have access, then it will be a contravention. But that's known, not known as a copy in terms of transmission rights. I don't understand your point. What I mean is that's not a replica. Well, but that's transmitted or disseminated. Well, if on the first floor there's only one user, on other floors other users may not be able to view it. But what we want is that we want, say, 10 viewers to be able to look at it. Now it's 6 o'clock. I'd like to remind you that uh, we're only about a quarter into the whole amendment bill, and we have only about seven meetings. That will take us up to mid-July. understand that many colleagues come into contact with the copyright ordinance for the first time, so I have been more lenient. Later, when we have more technical amendments, try as far as possible not to digress. Otherwise, for sure, in this legislative session, we won't be able to complete the scrutiny of the bill in just seven meetings. If necessary, I may convene additional meetings. So I really have to remind you. In my opinion, questions that should be asked should be asked. Well, we asked about museums and archives. Those were specific questions. I think the officials should give us some quicker answers. Mr. Sin Chong Kai, Mr. Chairman, I'd rather you call more meetings. I don't mind more meetings. But what I observed is that colleagues did not repeat questions, and those questions were not frivolous either. I understand. I just want you to understand the time frame. Let's move on. 52, yes, section 52. This is about copying by librarians or archivists on certain unpublished works. We propose to add in curators for certain unpublished works. But of course, some conditions have to be satisfied. Those conditions are the same. We're not proposing amendments. It's just that we would like to broaden the spectrum of works involved. From literary, dramatic, or musical work, we would like to expand that to include dramatic, musical, or artistic work. And then for bracket two and bracket three, basically we are proposing the addition of curator. Ms. Sito, I think 
Some library collections are of market value, so you should not affect the commercial interest of the copyright holder. I agree. But for museum collections and archive collections, they may not be of the same market value. So if you set uh, excessive restrictions, you may be restricting cultural and historical dissemination. Well, you are sh shaking your head. Please go back and look at it. Now you're adding in museums. Please go back and look at the positioning of these establishments, libraries, museums, and archives. Is it good to have the same set of procedures and provisions to govern all three? As I said, I believe you should be more lenient with museums and archives. Any more questions? Mr. Chen Chi Chin, what about published and unpublished works under this ordinance? Where is the biggest difference in terms of legal status? Well, very often, copyright works may have already been published. We should be more lenient on them because they are already made public. But for unpublished works, you often see that for unpublished works, like well, comments, they need to be published first. For library items, published and unpublished works may have, uh, say, cultural value. As Ms. Sito said, museums and archives uh, may have collected very precious items. So this is to broaden the exemption to cover unpublished works. All right, that's clear. Please move on. The next section is a new section. That is uh, the broadcasting of certain works by librarians, curators, and archivists. This is, uh, as uh, Ms. Sito said, bracket one and bracket two, specified librarians, curators, and archivists may play or show sound recordings or films. That means Many viewers may be able to listen to or watch sound recordings or films without infringing copyright. And the condition is that if the audience is required to pay for the playing or showing of the sound recording or film, the payment required is no more than a reasonable contribution towards the maintenance of the library, museum, or archive. That means the playing or showing is not for profit making. It's just that to support the reasonable expenses of the establishment. As for 52 capital A bracket 3, it stipulates that the playing or showing of a sound recording or film is not authorized by this section if or to the extent that licenses under licensing schemes are available authorizing the playing or showing in question and the person playing or showing the sound recording of film in question knew or ought to have been aware of that fact. Mr. To, this is good. We should have a provision to allow the curators to promote museum collections. My question just now was, if a viewer or a member of the public proactively wants to have a look at, say, soul copies or certain collections, can he or she do so? Under 52 capital A, is for the curator to, to decide, say, when to broadcast which, say, 100 top films in Hong Kong, then 
the viewer may not be able to watch the 101, the, the, the number 101 film or recordings. Well, that person should borrow the item from the library. Well, Mr. Chairman, then Mr. Wong should prepare some information for us in relation to the film archive as well as the government archive. If a user wants to make copies, what should happen? If it is for personal study, the exemption provision already covers that scenario. Well, Ms. Ho was asking about use on the spot. It's just like a book. If there is a book, read it. If it is a DVD, watch it. What if uh, there are more than one user? Well, if there are two copies, no problem. But then you restrict the number of watchers. Well, that's uh, for the sole copy. If colleagues don't have other questions, I'd like to ask about the Chinese version of bracket 3. Well, the English version is easy to understand, but the Chinese version may lead to misunderstanding because the Chinese version reads, so a direct translation is that if you have a license, you can play it, uh, the player knows the fact, then under this ordinance, there is no authorization or authorization will not be applicable. Well, the Chinese version is rather clumsy. That is, even if there is a license, no playing is allowed. But in the English version, you cannot play unless you have a license that authorizes you to do so. So can you make the Chinese version clearer? Well, for bracket three of the Chinese version, maybe you should start with Chui Fei. Should you draft it that way? It's just like the last provision. So to me, the Chinese version is ambiguous. I don't know whether members share my feeling. Mr. Wong, well, perhaps I should clarify as follows. In the Chinese version, in bracket 3, if in the establishment the person knows that there is a license, he should use the license. Otherwise, he should apply for exemption. But if there is a license, exemption is not applicable. Well, Mr. Chairman, maybe we should go back and examine the Chinese version. All right, let's move on to Section 53. The amendment to Section 53 is very simple. Originally, it's librarians or archivists uh, copying articles of cultural or historical importance will broaden that to cover curators. So it will be the librarian, curator or archivist of a specified library, museum or archive. Colleagues, any questions? Then we move on to 54, 54 capital A. Mr. To, well, for 53, section 53, what actual scenarios are you thinking of? 
say if、uh, there are exchanges with other jurisdictions, or maybe Guangzhou would like to borrow our items for exhibitions or before lending, copies can be made. What do you mean under Section Fifty Three? Well, Section Fifty Three means for articles of cultural or historical importance, they originally belong to Hong Kong, but the copyright holder lends them to the library purely for exhibition purpose. After exhibition, the articles will be sold or even exported from Hong Kong, and then Hong Kong may lose the articles forever. So, for the sake of these articles of cultural or historical importance, we would like to offer them exemption. That is,、uh, copies can be made, say, in the library without infringing any copyright. Mr. Chairman, if the article concerned is actually in the possession of the copyright holder rather than in the hands of the library, museum, or archive. The copyright holder doesn't want to give you the article; he may sell the article. So, of course, say the curator will have to judge whether or not the article is of cultural or historical importance. Here, this provision does not empower you to ask the the copyright holder for permission for making copies. He well. If under the ordinance he has the right, then he can make copies. Understand, Miss Ho is asking. In law, that article is not in the possession of the library. For example, that is physically or legally the i the article is not in your possession. That is, it is not your property. It's actually not in your hands. Then you can't even make a copy of it. Yes. Physically, the article is not with you. Well, this has something to do with property right. Miss Ho is correct. So my question is: first of all, the article has to be in the library or museum first, and then the copyright holder may sell the copyright of the article. There is such a possibility. Like you. So if in fact you already possess. The item in the library or museum, and you can make a copy of the article. Then, no matter how the article is sold,、uh, you won't be regarded as infringing the copyright. Well, this is the local legislation. What if, what about、um, the overseas、uh, buyer? So, according to a local legislation. If the copyright owner then sells the article, you won't be regarded as infringing the copyright. So that means I、uh, had a custody of the article, and then the article is sold to a third party, right? So I haven't infringed any copyright. Let's say if this is against the copyright laws overseas, then I won't be safeguarded. But there is no terrorist. Uh, extraterrestrial jurisdiction over this matter. Let's say if this painting is lent to a library for exhibition, is not a permanent donation, and perhaps、um, the successor would、uh, then take away the painting for sale. Then, if I make a copy, that depends on whether it is an article of cultural or historical importance. So. What if, in another jurisdiction, no copying whatsoever is allowed? As Mr. Dennis Quag said just now,、uh, if there is a、uh, sales contract prohibiting any copying, then what should be done? I think in Hong Kong, what we follow is the laws of Hong Kong. I think the buyer should be aware that there is such a piece of legislation in Hong Kong allowing libraries, museums. Archives to make copies before the article is lost through sale, or etc. Please go back, think about it, and reply to us later. You seem a bit uncertain. We don't see a problem. We can do that. 
Now we're at 53. Well, let's stop here. It's now 620. Okay. Next meeting scheduled for the 21st of April, Tuesday, 4.30 p.m. Okay? So meetings adjourned today.